Now I can see again. <clears throat> Uno, duo, tres, quatuar, quinque, sex. Okay, I got their attention now. <laughs> Albert Einstein once said that the greatest blunder of his life had been to reject a cosmological constant uh, in his attempt to explain the expansion of the universe. Actually, that was not his greatest blunder. In my opinion, his greatest blunder was in a quip he made to George Gamow, the physicist, who was a childhood hero of mine from sixth grade on. He told Gamow that compound interest is the strongest force in the universe. As a physics student in 1955, a high school physics student, I felt instinctively that he was wrong. I felt that more potent than compound interest was the force of ignorance. Unfortunately, uh, I had no opportunity at that point uh, to correct the master and improve his educational status. But my physics teacher, Doc Kaler, who had worked on the atomic project at Los Alamos during the war and had known Einstein personally and Oppenheimer and all those guys, Doc Kaler managed to get me an invitation to meet Einstein that would take place at the end of the spring semester. Unfortunately, I never got a chance to explain to Einstein why and how he was wrong. Einstein died on April 18th of 1955, and so he died misunderstanding the universe in such an important factor. <laughs> if I'd had the opportunity, I would have explained something that he surely must have known, namely that, well, I think he was making a joke on par with God does not play dice with the universe, <laughs> but. But anyway, I, I would have explained that uh, compound interest has meaning only in the context of human civilization. It has no meaning in the context of the strong and weak nuclear, uh, nuclear binding forces and stuff like that. Well, that being the case, we must ask, what is the most potent force in the universe, in the socio-political universe in which we must live? I've already ex said that I think that's ignorance. I think it is ignorance in general, and willful ignorance in particular. Dictators and priests have to have ignorant audiences, electorates, and congregations in order to successfully parasitize these populations and to rule. For such people, secular education in general and scientific education in particular are correctly seen as their enemies. Just think of the role of Betsy DeVos today. Yeah. Time does not allow a full disclosure of all my evidence, but a single illustrative example should suffice to show the interplay of religion, politics, and ignorance Consider the existential threat today of global warming. It is willful ignorance driven by unenlightened self-interest that causes right-wing religiously affiliated politicians to deny reality. If they knew of the principle of enlightened self-interest, trying to arrive at win-win solutions to disputes, to achieve longer lasting gains in their own interest, they would jump onto the green wagon and strive to solve the problem facing us. Ignorance of science and ignorance of philosophy prevents them from doing that. But hasn't even the Pope, the guy that named himself after me, <laughs> hasn't the Pope said that global warming is real? Well, yes, he did. However, he will not publicly admit that the driver of global warming 
is human overpopulation, a population that has surpassed the long-term carrying capacity of this spaceship we call Earth. Catholic dogma still holds that abortion, sterilization, and contraception, all these things that are needed for population control, are sins. As you probably know, strict Catholics have to believe some really incredible things. They have to believe that the goldfish wafers that they have in the mass are made of God bod. They have to believe that the Mogan David wine that they drink in communion contains heavenly hemoglobin. Not only that, they have to believe that the fertilized egg, a single cell, is a person possessed of a soul. Politicians are elected or driven from office according to the positions they take on such absurdities. The ignorant belief in single-celled persons has led Catholics to a denial of overpopulation as the driver of global warming. It is the same ignorant belief that led to the outlawing of stem cell research during the eight-year Bush presidency. I believe that that ban in medical research led to the 2013 death of my wife, Anne. My wife of 48 years, two months, two weeks, two days, and six hours. For you see, there are many similarities in the way that ordinary body cells can be transformed into stem cells in the way that they can transform into cancers. And so, within the eight years after Obama allowed resumption of stem cell research, discoveries had been made that would have kept Anne alive had they been known at the beginning of the Bush at the beginning of the Obama presidency. And those discoveries could have kept her alive until complete cures were available. So why did Bush, under Catholic pressure, suspend stem cell research? Well, you see, totipotent stem cells are the functional equivalent of zygotes, fertilized eggs. If you're trying to clone people, those stem cells could develop into one or more identical embryos, depending upon how you manipulated them. And you'll see, each one of those stem cells has a soul. If you took stem cells from my adipose tissue, alas, I have several trillion more of, more of those than I really want. If you took those fat cells and de-differentiated them into, in tissue culture, to totipotency, and then flush those former fat cells down the toilet, you would be guilty of a genocide more heinous than that of Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Pol Pot, and the Holy Roman Inquisition all rolled up together. I first met Madeleine Murray O'Hare, the founder of American Atheists, in the autumn of 1976. I had dedicated my life to her cause and to this organization less than a year later. Right from the beginning, Madeline showed how atheism, the liberation of the mind, was the most fundamental liberation of all liberation types of movements. Be they women's liberation, LGBTQ liberation, or any of the other liberation movements uh, that people here today might, might subscribe to. All liberation movements are facilitated by the advancement of atheism. All liberation movements are opposed or retarded by the survival of religious beliefs. Beliefs that without exception are founded on ignorance. Because atheism 
and the skeptical mindset of which it is a part motivates us to remove impediments to obtaining knowledge. Atheism is the antidote to ignorance. Atheism is a necessity if civilization is to survive. Long before I enlisted in Madeleine Murray O'Hare's War on Ignorance, she dreamed of founding an atheist university, actually an atheological atheist seminary. It would be an institution of higher learning centered around a precious library and archive of books and ephemera that preserve the worldwide heritage of humanism and atheism and free thought. It would gather up the secular, sacred thought relics of those who lived and fought and died before us in the war to liberate the human mind. The Charles E. Stevens American Atheist Library and Archives was intended to be the research home to atheist writers and scholars, writers who would publish leaflets, books, and articles. Both scholarly and popular materials would be produced that would counter the inundation of ignorance gushing forth from the hydrothermal wellsprings of religious and other atheist organizations uh, and, and anti-liberty organizations. American Atheist Press, for which I have been the editor since 1995, since the 1995 abduction and murder of Madeline and her family, would be the vehicle through which their research and philosophical investigations would be published to the world. To that end, from 1979 onward, I wrote articles for our journal, American Atheist. Collectively, those articles could be used as a textbook for atheist activists to defend their positions and advance the cause of reason. Some years ago, they all were collected into the four volumes of my so-called red books, Through Atheist Eyes, Scenes from a World That Won't Reason. Madeline's university would be an, institu an institution of higher learning where all the world's religions would be subjected to critical, logical, legal, historical, and scientific analysis. The scientific philosophy of atheism would be seen to rest on firm foundations. It would be woven into a consilient system of interlocking and convergent lines of evidence, just like the world of science itself. Graduates would not only be equipped to defend atheism from the attacks of religious and political apologists. As a result of thorough counter-apologetic studies, they would be able aggressively to enlarge the world of science and reason. They could reduce the bounds and bonds of religious ignorance and superstition. Madeline hoped that her graduates would be able to go out into the public and liberate believers from the thought chains that were keeping them in the army of ignorance. They would recruit them into the liberating legions fighting to preserve science, political freedom, and reason. I don't remember her ever doing a mathematical analysis of the feasibility of such a thing, but we can do that here today. What if for every 10 people, I don't know, I think there are 10 people in a, in a complete row. What if for every 10 people here, two, believers were deconverted in the next year. And this continued on, and those two in proportion went on to convert uh, to uh, deconvert to other non-believers, uh, other believers uh, in, in, in the next year and so on for every 10 of you. What would be the effects then of a 20% deconversion rate? Well, I haven't learned how many people are registered for this conference, 
but I'm sure it's at least 700. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we had that number, I think, a, a year or two ago. In 10 years, the 700 atheists in the audience would have become 4,334 people doing their damnedest <laughs> to succeed at reality testing. In 20 years, it would have grown to almost 27,000, and in 30 years, to 166,000 plus. That actually would be um, 22,000 more than the number of Jehovah's Witnesses who are going to be going to heaven. Um, I don't know if you're aware, though, there, are, there will only be um, homosexuals, male homosexuals, uh, in heaven because they have to be men who have not been defiled by women. <laughs> I, I'm sure you all know that. So it's hopeless, you're not gonna go to heaven. Uh, anyway, well, actually some of you might, come to think of it. <laughs> but anyway, that's just starting with this audience. But what if we started with one million of the best educated atheists in America today? In 10 years, they would be over six million, certainly enough to take hold of the reins of government and leadership in this nation. In 20 years, they would be over 38 million, and in 30 years, they'd be over 237 million, which would be actually coming hard on the heels of the total American population in 2017. Such is the power of compound interest. Compound interest, <laughs> hmm, <laughs> maybe Al was right. <laughs> Could I have been wrong for the first time in my life? <laughs> oh, wait, I forgot. I, I was wrong once before. I thought I had made a mistake. <laughs> Eight days ago would have been the 100th birthday of our founder, Madeline Murray O'Hare. And in 2020, we will mark the 25th anniversary of the abduction and murder of her and her family. And so I wish to turn my closing thoughts back to them. As par excellence practitioners of the art of reality testing, the Murray O'Hares walked ever daily, every, every walked ever in the daily light of the real world. But they were also dreamers. They dreamt of the day when no individual life ever again would be placed in jeopardy by the reality-testing failure known as religion. The survival of our species should not be endangered by deluded minds pursuing a cosmic will of the wisp. No one ever again should be forced to pay taxes to support an invisible kingdom known only on the say-so of its parasitic ambassadors, the clergy. Never again should the world be thrust back into a dark age. They dreamed that the divisiveness and hatred fomented by religion would be overcome by rational minds, no longer willing to do evil when given the command, thus saith the Lord. They held to the hope that humanity would realize before it was too late that they are one with nature, brothers and sisters of the humblest plants and animals, our fellow travelers on this spaceship we call Earth. Such were some of the dreams of the Murray O'Hare family, and such were the dreams of those who honored them by carrying on their work and keeping American atheists alive. Among those I am honored to tell you, most important of those is here with us this morning. Spike Tyson, if you are able to stand, he is at the very back of the room. Spike Tyson, single-handedly, he, he single-handedly 
took over the control and running of the American Atheist Center when the Murray O'Hares were abducted and we didn't know what had happened to them. He guarded their personal home until it was seized by the IRS who confiscated all of his own personal effects as well. Would we please stand in honor of Spike Tyson? Thank you, Spike. We would not have this conference here today had it not been for what he did back in 1995. After their disappearance and we resumed control of this organization, we all resolved that the death of the Murray O'Hare's bodies should not also mark the death of their dreams. We who carried on their work had to redream the dreams they could no longer dream, and we strove to dream beyond them. I have spent my entire adult life dreaming that the light of science would one day dispel the darkling ignorance of religion. I have dreamed of a day when political decisions are based on facts and evidence, not on communications allegedly received from a spirit realm. I have dreamed that evolutionary science would sweep away the false claims of creationism and with that, destroy the fundamentalist forms of ignorance that we call Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. I have dreamed that a scholarly consensus would develop that Jesus of Nazareth never existed as a historical figure. It is yet my dream that all the world will be galvanized into action to counteract the disastrous effects of climate change, which changes are already now having an effect in, in human activity is one of the many consequences, along with increasing social unrest, violence, and worldwide hunger that result from overpopulation. There are more travelers on this spaceship Earth than can be carried alive very much far farther on this cosmic journey. I continue to dream of a time when no one in America shall be denied the full benefit of the First Amendment because of race, sex, gender, or gender identification. When women are accorded full economic, social, and political equality with men, and gay, bisexual, lesbian, transgender, and transsexual individuals enjoy the legal and social equality guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. Until I can no longer dream at all, I cannot cease to dream of a time when the world will come to see that there are no such things as souls or spirits, and that the present life is the only one we shall ever have. There are no souls in psychos, and there are no single-celled persons. There will be no life after death, and we must do our utmost to improve the world and the lives that are ours in the here and now. I still dream that we will learn to create the conditions that are needed to maximize our chances to experience love and beauty that an ethics based on enlightened self-interest will replace the taboo moralities of the Abrahamic religions. I dream yet that win-win methods of conflict resolution will become universal. But as I speak these final lines, all my dreams 
are being endangered by a nightmarish turn in American history. The hopeful dreams that I dream in the dark of night give way to nightmares that I must endure in the bright light of day. Unreason, superstition, and a cruel and unjust Bible-based morality threaten to overcome the enlightenment dreams that inspire the founding of our constitutional democracy. Nuremberg-style rallies are stoking neo-fascist fires. Fully a third of my fellow Americans are lining up to submit to authoritarian rule. When I listen to a dangerous demagogue bellowing and whining on my car radio, the voice of Adolf Hitler screaming for Lebensraum, wir müssen Lebensraum haben, comes back from the beehive radio in the farmhouse in which I grew up. It ricochets in my brain. The sciences that could save the world from collapse into barbarism are being suppressed at the highest levels of our government. Chaos is supplanting civil order. The second law of thermodynamics threatens to destroy the knowledge and liberties so heroically acquired in the face of all the papal bulls, inquisitions, and persecutions of scientists that for two millennia have retarded the progress of science and the advancement of knowledge. Next month, I will turn 80, and that has been focusing my thoughts recently. Not long ago, I woke from fitful sleep and I realized the dreams I dream no longer are mine to fulfill. From now on, it will be for other men and women of goodwill to fight the good fight against ignorance, superstition, and theopolitical corruption. It will be for others to breathe the air of a, of a world in balance where overpopulation has been overcome and women can control the reproductive functions of their own bodies. A peaceful planet where reason and evidence shape the political behavior of the passengers traveling on this plundered planet. It will be for others to live in a completely secular state where health care is a right, not a privilege, where cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and all other diseases that snuff out lives in before due time have been eradicated. A world where, despite the biological reality of inequalities, all may become all that they are capable of becoming. I am sustained by the hope that my dreams and my books will outlive me, that they will kindle fire in other brains and stimulate other muscles to labor for the cause of reason. If I have left even a small part of this world a better place, a happier place, because I have lived and labored, if I have made it easier for some of those who follow me to love, experience beauty, and exercise their creative powers, I shall not have lived in vain, however small my impact may have been. Those of us who ran the race at the side of the Murray O'Hare family, those of us who picked up their batons when they were cast down from their hands by assassins in 1995, those of us who still survive, 
we soon must pass those batons on to a new generation of men and women who are stronger runners, fiercer fighters. We are both fortunate and proud to have been able to pass on the biggest baton to President Nick Fish. But there are many more batons to be passed on. Some of you here today must take them from our hands and carry them higher and farther across the finish line into a completely secular world. Among the most precious documents in my possession are several certificates that Madeleine Murray O'Hare issued back in the 1980s. Those are the certificates conferring life memberships upon my wife Anne and me. I hope that your membership cards in American Atheists should be among your most precious documents, whether they be student membership cards or platinum life membership certificates because they certify that you are striving to succeed at reality testing. They show that you have already enlisted in the war against ignorance. But now, if the life of reason is to escape extinction, it is urgent that you engage more fully in the battles that that you become captains in the war against ignorance. Some of you can contribute money in order to support all of the things that are going on at our American Atheist Center. But even more important, perhaps much, much more important, many of you have skills and talents that you can contribute to ensure the survival of humanity. If you are one of those, please tell Nick Fish what you can do. Perhaps you can work remotely somehow to help our cause. Our planet is in crisis. Our nation is in danger. Our freedoms hang in the balance. A tidal wave of ignorance, amplified by the political power of shamans, priests, and preachers, threatens to snuff out the life of reason. You must not flee the field of battle. Don't let the dark ages come again. Please. Please.